Namaskar. It is truly an honor and a privilege for me to be here amongst all of you today. It clearly seems like I am an honorary member of the Manipuri community with the amount of love that I've seen today. So thank you very much. It's also a privilege for me to be speaking here and I'd like to write at the outset thank Jawaharlal Nehru University for giving us this platform. I'd like to thank the Methi Students Union for putting this together and all events, small or big, they take a lot of effort and I can see that effort. I would also like to thank Mutum who seems to never stop in, and is always running around and all of you because it's a Sunday and I've heard that a lot of you have come from very far away and this truly warms my heart because it tells me how important this topic is for all of us. Now today as we pay our respects to the Patriots, I have to say that, you know, I thought it would be extremely important for us not just to talk about the Patriots Day and to honor them, but also to go beyond the conflict and talk about really how important Manipur is, not just to the Manipuris, not just to the region, but also to all of us in India. And as I stand here today, I don't stand here as a Maiti, as a Kuki, as somebody from the region. I stand here as an Indian because I think it's very important to hear my perspective on what I feel is possibly the most important region geostrategically for this country. Many, many of you have heard my talks before and many of you have heard me talk and criticize about the kind of binaries that have been drawn in the media. We've spoken about the kind of binaries that are completely faulty and that come from a place of absolute misunderstanding. Those binaries may be tribal versus non-tribal, might be majority versus minority, might be Hindu versus Christian. All that reflects to me is how little we know about this region, how little we know about Manipur. And for that, I can only say that it is shameful. I think what we need to understand is that Manipur is a lot more than that. And the people who put these bin bi uh, binaries either don't understand Manipur, either don't understand the Northeast region, or are doing this purposely. A lot of people today, my distinguished co-speakers and panelists, who I have had the privilege to learn more from today than I can ever hope to offer on this platform, spoke about some very important topics. They spoke about narrative building and they wondered why is that that our narratives are being skewed? The answers are simple. The narratives are being skewed because we are fragmented. The narratives are being skewed because we are not being able to put a cohesive dialogue. Narratives are being skewed because we've decided to organize ourselves just as we've been hit by conflict. This should have been done before. The society should have come before on many, many other occasions. We should not have waited for a conflict to bring us together. The second thing that one of our panelists also mentioned is Western interest. And that is to me of great importance. Because when you talk about Western interests, you have to wonder why are they so interested? Are we interested in some, um, some parts of the Western world that we've never been to? Do, does our parliament deliberate on conflicts that are happening in other countries? No, we don't. The reason for Western interest again is much larger than what we think. I think we don't understand the implications of why people are showing interest. A lot of people gave representations to the Western countries. They spoke to me about it and I said this is absolutely the most horrifying thing to do because when we ourselves don't understand this region and we don't understand Manipur, do you think somebody from the West who's never visited India, let alone the Northeast, is going to be able to understand it? This is to me against 
our national duty and our national unity. But it is what it is, and we must counter it to the best of our abilities. I will come to the other reasons of Western interests and Western narratives that are being built. But before that, let me come to the third point that somebody made. They said that nobody knows the Northeast. Yes, it's true. People don't know the dynamics of the Northeast. I was watching a news debate the other day, and there were all these spokespersons from different parties who'd come together on the news to discuss the Northeast. A simple question was asked. Name the seven states. They couldn't name it. So when we don't know the basics, how do we expect to understand the larger game plan in this? I also will add to this that it is very important to understand the value of not just the geostrategic location, but what this geostrategic location has to offer to the world. And I don't think we completely comprehend the value of Manipur. I don't mean the rest of the country. I don't think people of Manipur comprehend the value of Manipur. They don't comprehend the importance of Manipur being India's gateway to the rest of the world. There was a time, again, a very shameful time, and I'll say this, and you know, I myself is em I'm embarrassed in saying this, wherein the South used to be looked upon as just a homogeneous region. We didn't understand the different states. In Delhi, we'd say, ah, Madrasi, Madrasi. We also have now seen that that has changed. And it started changing when the IT sector boomed, when money flew into this region, and when they came into their own. That is what the Northeast needs. You want to bring the Northeast on the map, we complain that nobody knows the Northeast, nobody travels to the Northeast, nobody understands our culture. Bring it on the map. How do you bring it on the map? You bring it on the map by understanding the geostrategic value of this place, and then acting thereupon on the understanding of that. Now, many people say that, uh, you know, uh, the British uh, brought about relative peace to the Northeast. Many people say that these ethnic uh, conflicts are historical legacy conflicts. And uh, with colonial rule, and this has been argued, with colonial rule there has been there was certain establishment of artificial peace. I disagree. The British policies of exclusion and isolation institutionalized divisions, the divisions that we see today. And what are those divisions? Through the conflict in Manipur, we've seen the fault lines come up, tribal versus non-tribal, majority versus minority, Hindu versus Christians. However, as much as I agree that these are legacy issues, I also have to bring forth the role of external factors. And those roles cannot be ignored because we are living in a world like we've never lived before. Look at the Northwestern frontier. The Northwestern frontier no longer is accessible to India for trade or commerce. Look at the Northeastern frontier. The Northeastern frontier accesses Southeast Asia. It accesses a region that is not just economically important to us, but also has a lot of cultural value. Our soft power went through the Northeast to reach these areas in terms of Buddhism, culture, ethnic relationships, so on and so forth. But this has also been the area of what Bertel Littner calls the Great Game East. What is the Great Game East? The Great Game East is what we see unfolding today. The Great Game West has already been defined. It's already been won. And today, we have the Great Game East, which is being played on our doorsteps across our boundaries in Manipur, in Myanmar. As early as 1985, there was a, there was a September 2nd issue an edition on the Beijing Review, which is considered a mouthpiece of the Chinese government. That article, which was called uh, Opening to the Southwest, an expert opinion, 
was written by one of the vice ministers of communication, now former vice minister, called Panchi. Panchi outlined an entire geostrategic outline of Myanmar, India, and what it could achieve. This included railroads, this included uh, waterway connectivity, this included some amount of political changes. We saw this come into action not much later. If we look at it, Yunnan regions of Myanmar, Shizuan regions of Myanmar are landlocked. They thought it would be a great idea to build the infrastructure that was needed right down to the Indian Ocean to be able to carry the goods, the trade um, across Myanmar. And that's what they did. They worked at rocket speed. There was uh, the railroad, which uh, came up from Michiki now to Lasho. The Irrawaddy uh, River today is used as waterways for trade, commerce. Um, and um, so on and so forth. We've also seen on the Indian uh, Indo-Pacific region, the kind of revisionism, Chinese revisionism. Um, we've seen Cocoa Islands that has been taken over by the Chinese. They're building airstrips. We've seen, uh, we, we know of the fact that the Cocoa Islands is only 55 kilometers away from Andamans. Where does all of this cross from? It crosses from across your border. These were also the regions where a lot of insurgency was supported. Of course, it was supported with uh, arms and ammunition. And we know historically, the Naga insurgency, the Mizo insurgency, all were backed by, um, either Chinese arms and ammunition weapons, or by the erstwhile East Pakistan being used as bases, or by the ISI. Today, maybe that policy has changed. Maybe China is not playing an active role in terms of supporting insurgency. But is the grave weapon market area alive and thriving? Yes, it is. Are we getting secondhand weapons? Yes, we are. What are we seeing in Manipur today? And I cast no aspersions. We have no evidence right now out in the open. But inferences can surely be drawn. And I think that is going to be a huge part of what we are going to have to contend with in the future. For India, More is our gateway to Southeast Asia. For India, it is important to be able to have access to these areas irrespective of the kind of troubled region that it is. We have, you know, we have the Arakan army, we have the Chin state, we have active insurgents in all these areas. And it has been difficult, but that doesn't mean that we don't have enough infrastructural um, capabilities and investments. But, you know, let me show you just two short slides. I don't have a lot of time. It will tell you the kind of companies that are working just across the border from you the kind of investments there are, and the kind of critical minerals that are available. You see, we, we, want to, we want to be stuck in this idea of we want to talk about narratives, and we want to talk about you know, the immediate conflict. But I think our perspective has to be bigger. If we want to solve this situation, we have to address it from the grassroots. And to address it from the grassroots, we have to see the whole picture. Can we see the two slides, please? And I'll give you a minute to absorb these slides. This is the kind of, uh, uh, it's divided into location, state, ethnic group, the resources that are available. The, these resources are critical resources. They're really important for growing economies like China and India. It's also really important for growing economies like the US. And we already know the US has played, you know, and the West, not just the US, has played a huge amount of role in destabilizing certain regions like we have seen, let's say, in the northwestern frontier. Even if we go back to our colonial past, you know, the British were very reticent to leave the northeast. We must never forget that they had an idea of the crown colony, which they wanted to keep even as they left India. They wanted to keep the northeast as a crown colony because they saw the vantage point that the northeastern frontier provided from them. Can you see the next slide, please? I'll give you a minute to look at this and understand. The kind of companies that are working there, the kind of uh, minerals that are available, and if you go down, yeah. 
and the kind of money that is to be had. Now, if you look at this, if you look at these, what does it tell you? It tells you about the vested interests that are playing in this area, the great game East. And I think that is what we have to deal with. That is what we have to understand. Of course, we can look at this as a mere ethnic conflict, and as we should, but that doesn't mean that that's what it's going to remain. It doesn't mean that if it continues, it isn't going to become something larger. We have international interest, we have money, and we have critical minerals. I think nothing could be more important for the future. But let me say, that for India is not unaware of this and it has made its efforts, whether it's the Kaladan multimodal project where the first transit to Sitway has already started, but it has a 110 kilometer development that it still needs to do right into Mizoram. Unfortunately, that travels through some of the most troubled states of Myanmar and that may delay the project. But if that happens, India knows that it needs to depressurize the chicken's neck and therefore it has offered this sort of an alternative. We must not lose heart, but we must be aware. You see, Myanmar owes 40% of its debt to China and therefore it has a certain amount of influence or agency. However, Burmese nationalism also plays a role which will not allow China, hopefully, to have the kind of influence that we fear it will. India has played a great role in keeping a neutral stance. A lot of people have said, oh, you know, Myanmar doesn't have democracy, Myanmar doesn't have this, you know. For us, our concern is that we must be on good terms with our neighbors. And that is what we've done. Therefore, if you remember in the first month of the conflict, the Myanmarese government had taken out a notice that it warned the citizens to stay away from poppy cultivation and to stay away from causing any communal disharmony. This is the result of good diplomacy. But as I am running out of time, let me say this. I think it is our responsibility to bring solutions to this conflict. You know, we say the defense forces didn't do this, the defense forces didn't do that. I've said this many a times and many a times all of you must have heard me say this, that civil society has a role to play and the role must be played by the civil societies that live on the borders because they safeguard these borders. If they do not accept the fact that there is illegal infiltration, if they don't accept basic facts that there is a problem with poppy cultivation, if they don't accept the fact that there was a time that money put top the list of heroin usage that came across the border then we cannot even begin a dialogue. To me, let me say this. Today is Patriots Day, and we've all gathered together to honor them. But if we really want to honor them, I think we must honor them in the right way. We must honor them in upholding the values that they have held. We must honor them in respecting the territorial integrity of Manipur. And I think we must honor them in knowing that it's just not the territorial integrity of Manipur, it is also the t territorial integrity of India.